Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Father Chris Alar here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. Surprise, we got a few people here today. We had a, a lot of snow. I got stranded in Florida. Uh, didn't arrive till three o'clock this morning and um, had to get up to finish this talk. So it's been quite um, a last couple days, but God bless. I was down there for donor visits for our new monastery, uh, for awards presentation, and uh, also filming with um, Mark Wahlberg's brother, Jim Wahlberg, for our WTN show. So please keep all that in prayer. Today we have a great topic, the misunderstood Mother Teresa, believe it or not. Believe it or not, she gets a lot of criticism. It's really surprising. And so we're gonna clear the air on that, explain to you, summarize her teachings, and why she is a saint. But let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask through the intercession of St. Mother Teresa that we may always open our minds and hearts and our, our prayers for those who go without, for those who live in poverty, both materially and especially spiritually. And Mother Mary, we ask that you wrap your mantle around them. And through your intercession, as well as Mother Teresa's, we bring these souls to Christ. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, this is an incredible saint that matters to us actually more than normal, because he gave, God gave her to us at our times, this time in human history. And this is why she's so important. Now, she was born August 26, 1910. Now, I looked up her name, and I actually, it sounds Italian, but I verified the pronunciation through the BBC. And it is Agnes, or Agnes, Ganya Boyacci. That sounds Italian. But no, she was born of Albanian parents, and she was born in Macedonia. All right, so now, <clears throat> she said, By blood, I am Albanian. By citizenship, I am Indian. She lived in Calcutta, right, which is India. By faith, I am a Catholic nun. As to my call, I belong to the world. But as to my heart, I belong entirely to Christ. Very rare have I heard something summarized so bad. That explains that we are Catholics first, American second, and then our political affiliation a distant third. And so she kind of summarized that. Let's look at her next slide. Now, this is a picture, a verified picture of her. Uh, her father died when she was eight, okay? And it plunged the family into poverty, as it does most of the time in countries like India. And she decided at the age of 12 to become a nun. So she made this decision very early. Now, let's go to our next slide. At 18, this picture was falsely sent around the internet. When I first saw that picture, I said, this is Mother Teresa at age 18. I was like, wow, <laughs> she's beautiful. Well, we shouldn't think that way because that's a false picture of her. You may have seen this picture. It's all over the internet. It's not true. This is not her. This is another lady, but she would have been to me nonetheless beautiful. All right. So she left uh, Agnes, at that time, left her family to join the Sisters of Our Lady of Loreto religious community. Okay, so she had a calling, <clears throat> but the question became, why would God, and we're going to get into this later, allow so much suffering uh, for someone who had given her life completely to God? Let's look at just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a real brief summary on her life so you can see who she was, and then we're going to get into the teaching. All right, 1942, she made a vow, all right? She made a secret vow to God to give him anything he asked, anything. He would not, she would not refuse him anything, right? Now, <clears throat> guess what happened? God took her up on it. Be careful what you promise. God will take you up on it. It works the same for us with vows today. And this is why I'm like, oh my gosh, every day when I do my examination of conscience, you know, how did I live my vows? 
So God took her at a word and put her vow to the test. Just like we Marians do. That's part of the reason she suffered. Because she said, you strip me of anything. And he did. He even stripped her of consolations like the poor people are stripped. Not just of material goods, but the poor people are stripped of consolations and joy. Because they're living in such squalor and poverty. And so he stripped that from her so she could feel what it was like to be truly homeless and full of poverty. Only because she gave him permission. But what that does is it puts her up on a spiritual level and union with God like on any other. And so this is what the message is. Now, then a few years later, 1946, Jesus told her to quit her comfortable job she was, do you know anybody know what she did? She was a principal. And to go serve the poor. Jesus told her, there are convents all over caring for the rich and well-to-do people. But for my poor, there is none. Not N-U-N. <laughs> N-O-N-E. There were no convents for the poor, treating the poor. And so she did as she was told. Then she didn't hear God's voice for the next half century. Wow. Thank you, God. <laughs> Thank you. Um, she didn't hear it. Um, as harsh as that sounds, this is not unfamiliar in the Bible. You know, I read this account of people who are attacking Mother Teresa. It's unbelievable. And they said that she was this masochist because she, she wanted people to suffer. No, she didn't. She saw the redemptive power when God allowed them to suffer and how it can be redemptive. So anyway, this is the Bible. The Bible and the lives of the saints. They undergo this all the time, a test, a test of, of, of commitment and faithfulness. All right, what about Jeremiah, Hosea, or Job? Think how they suffered, right? How much the Bible talks about suffering for the Lord. This is common. The book of Sirach says, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trials. Uh-oh. I am wimpy when it comes to that. This is one area. When, when I was doing this, I was working on this on the airplane because we had so much to do in Florida. And I didn't get this, and I'm working on it. The plane kept getting delayed and delayed. I was supposed to fly out at 7 and then 8 and then 9 and then 10, and then midnight, and, and, and so I'm working on this in the airport, and it's so funny because I'm hearing about how she deals with suffering and trials, and the whole time I'm getting delay after delay after delay, and I'm like, okay, am I going to live the example of Mother Teresa, <laughs> or am I going to get flustered and frustrated? And so God had me working on this at the exact same time I was going through trials, Right? And so it was funny because we live halfway between Albany and, and Hartford. Uh, Stockbridge, our shrine, is right in between Albany and Hartford, which are two airports. So I was originally scheduled to fly out of Albany, and then that got delayed by three hours. So I quick switched over to the plane to go to Hartford because they weren't supposed to get as much snow, and the flight was earlier. So I said, hey, that makes perfect sense. So I quick jumped onto the flight for Hartford. Then that flight was delayed five hours and the flight for Albany was back on track. And I'm like, oh, let me try to get back onto the Albany flight. And the woman said, you can't do that. And I'm like, is the plane full? And she says, no, it's only half full. I says, please get me on that flight. And so here the whole time that I'm incurring these trials, and this is so minor. And I, I really thought about that. When I thought of what was a big deal and what was a big issue is so small compared to what these people that Mother Teresa worked with dealt with. It was so eye-opening. The way God works is incredible how he teaches us these lessons. And so it's one of my few trips through the airport where I kept a smile the entire time. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was very good. It was an eye-opening experience. All right, so now, uh, 
Let's go to our next slide. These are the slums of Calcutta. You want to see real problems? Those are the slums of Calcutta. Her suffering began there. With her cure, her care, and curing the poorest of the poor. She taught others to see Christ disguised in the poor. Right? Remember St. Faustina when the beggar came to the door? And, and it looked like he was begging and she wasn't going to take care of him, and then she took care of him. And what happened? The beggar turned to Jesus. You never know when that guy standing on the street corner that holds up the signs, we've all seen them, saying, help me, I can't, I, 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 I don't have no food, I have nothing to eat. And we drive by. Now, you got to be careful and prudent. I remember one time I gave $20 to one and then I made a wrong turn and I went two miles up the road and I realized I was going the wrong way and I came back and that person was coming out with a case of beer. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, we gotta be, we don't wanna, you know, enable somebody, but you never know when that person's gonna be Jesus. Like, like St. Faustina. Now, as Catholics were totally abandoning their faith, she finds or founds the fastest growing religious order in the world. What order is that? Let's look at our next slide. The Missionaries of Charity, 1950. Look at these nuns. They are God's precious, precious spouses. So 1950, she began the Missionaries of Charity. Simple but beautiful, always wearing the same habit. Then in 1952, she really got moving. So she founded the missionaries in 1950. 1952, she really gets moving. Listen to this. She found a woman dying in the streets, and the woman was being eaten by rats and ants. This poor woman, the, the description of it just sent chills down my spine. Mother Teresa found this woman. Her body is lying in the slums of Calcutta, and there's all these rats eating her. And ants covered her body. She thought she was dead. The woman was alive. Unbelievable. And so she said this, uh, that uh, there was nobody to care for her. So she picked her up and took her to the hospital, but it was too late. And Mother Teresa said, if I just could have got to her earlier. So she realizing that there were many others in the streets like this. So she opened uh, a place called Nirmal Hirde. This is called Pure Heart, a home for the dying. All right. In the first 20 years, 20,000 people came there. Yet we criticized Mother Teresa. Half of them died knowing that they were finally loved. One man said, I have lived like an animal my whole life but now I am dying like an angel. Let's look at our next slide. This is a picture of it. This is a picture, a normal here day. This was, you know how Mother Teresa became known? I always wondered that. How did people find out about Mother Teresa? This is how they found out about her. In 1969, a British television documentary called Something Beautiful for God made Mother Teresa famous because of this hospital. She'd already been in the slums for 23 years, right? But now it came to the limelight. Mother Teresa hated the public eye, but she said, if it will help the poor, I will do it. And, and, and that's the same, I, I, one one million to the degree. I didn't really feel like putting this talk together after all day yesterday, fighting at airports, changing flights, snowstorms and we got home and we you couldn't even see the road coming home from Albany but I said Lord if this helps anybody even one person it's worth it and so in 1979 she received the Nobel Peace Prize right Uh, then later in 1985 she got the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the plaque she got with it described her as the saint of the gutters the saint of the gutters. Now, there have been others who've come out of the gutters and made something of their lives. But you know what? She's the only one that we know of, at least, that came from the gutters, rose up, and returned to the gutters. That's what makes her so special. 
Let's look at her next slide. Basically, she was in the gutters for only one reason, to bring the love of Christ to each soul. And that's where that sign, I love that quote, a life not lived for others is not a life. A life not lived for others is not a life. And so she was in the gutters to bring Christ. The world only knew her as this tiny little diminutive, slouched over, little old lady with gnarly hands. And what a power pack. You know, um, everybody who met her said she was beautiful, that her eyes sparkled, she radiated joy. And some, again, as I said, accused her. She's attacked. Uh, it's unbelievable how the devil works. Why would you attack her? All right, some say that she never went to the root cause of the problem. She just kept saying suffering is good. No. She knew very well the root of the problem. What was the root of the problem? Let's look. Look at that slide. The most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved. She said loneliness and being unloved was a way greater poverty than material poverty. She said the greatest disease today is not leprosy, not tuberculosis, but rather the feeling of being unwanted, uncared for, and deserted. The greatest evil is the lack of love and charity, the terrible indifference in towards one's neighbor. Wow. You know, Mother Teresa, she never played the crowd or the famous celebrity issue. Um, people would always often try to reduce her to just some celebrity. Let's look at our next slide. Here she is meeting with Ronald Reagan. Good man. Good man. Let's look at the next slide. Here she is speaking at the presidential. Listen to this. She was speaking out against abortion, all right, as the greatest destroyer of peace when she got the Nobel Peace Prize at Oslo, right, at the Nobel ceremony. And then get a load of this. Where she's speaking in this photo that I had Brother Mark put up. She shocked Washington. The National Prayer Breakfast in Washington. Everybody was there having a good time. You know what she talked about? The evils of contraception. You should have seen those politicians. <laughs> I saw a clip of it. I was laughing. I was like, nothing like a four foot little old lady to really set you straight, right? So she said abortion can lead to nuclear war because in our world now we are accepting violence as an answer to solve our problems. Violence is the answer to solve your problems. And so nuclear war, abortion will lead to nuclear war. Because if abortion, which is violence to solve your quote unquote problem of a pregnancy, you become to think that all violence will solve all problems. And that's what leads to nuclear war. We're having problems, go to war. She rejected the sexual revolution and all its lies. In many ways, the 20th century was the worst. Most died for their faith. She stood against all of that. She was a martyr. She was. More people were martyred in the 20th century than any other. She was one. Not a red martyr, a white martyr. But now she's a model for the 21st century to bring unity. Not just the obvious between the rich and the poor, but listen to this. The greatest division in our 20th century religions is this difference in doctrine between good works and social justice, that's basically what good works are, and the truth. Here's the point, everybody. Focusing only on social justice, which is what our society tells us we have to do, love everybody, never offend anybody, at the expense of the truth is a lie. She was both orthodox and charitable. She taught us a major lesson. She was a witness to the truth. You know what she said? She was a witness. She said this, 
Truth without love is cold. And love without truth is just shallow sentimentality. Right? And so in the 21st century, Christian witnesses must follow her or we will disappear completely. I always laugh. You've heard me say it. We get letters all the time. Father, we love the Marians. With Father Kaz and Father Chris, with Father Kaz, we know we're going to get love. Father Kaz just exudes love. God bless him. But with Father Chris, we know we're going to get the truth. <laughs> and I always say, you need both. And that's what Mother Teresa's whole message was. You got to have love and the truth. You can't just have love and let people condone them living in their sinfulness. You must have an approach that is love and truth. Okay, so here's one of the things I like the most. The Eucharist, okay? The Eucharist in the life of Mother Teresa. This was written by Father Sebastian uh, Vazhagkala. Now, I talked last week about Dark Night of the Soul. If you haven't seen that talk, please. It's already got like 90,000 views already from last week. And we talked about the purgative way, the illuminative way, and the unitive way. And your, and, and your journey to the saint, to being a saint. Guess what, everybody? Those are the three parts of the mass. And this is amazing. So this priest does a good job of analyzing the mass in three parts. The purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. Now, what do we mean here? All right, so this is what Jesus taught her. The first thing is the purgative. We got to be purified. Where in the Mass are we purified? The penitential right. I confess to Almighty God. Its main purpose is to dispose us, to prepare us, to be enlightened by the readings. That's the next stage, the illumination, the illuminative way. We are enlightened by the word of the scriptures. And so we are prepared to receive this illumination. And so the mass depends on how we are prepared. So this penitential rite is being purified like the beginning of our spiritual life. It can be painful as we have to see our sins. But then we're illuminated in the liturgy of the word. So you go from purgative, I confess, I'm a sinner, to listening to the gospel, I'm being enlightened, illumined. We have to, any place you put a seed, you got to sow the, the seed in good soil. You, you plow it, you weed it, you, 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 you um, prepare it. You even put manure on it, Right? And so the same principle applies here because we're doing this, we're preparing, we're being illuminated. And what does that do? That prepares us for the third level, the unitive way, which is union. And when is that in the mass? Holy communion, communion, union, the union of communion. You're being united with God. In the mass, you go from all three parts, the purgative way, I'm being purged of my sins. I confess, Lord, I'm a mess. I, I, and what I've done and what I've failed to do. Then you are enlightened, illumined by reading of the scriptures. I, I'm, I'm getting into the illuminative way. Then that opens me and prepares me to receive God. And when you receive him, I'm united with him. And now I've entered into the unitive way. This is beautiful. This is the way of union. So just as... In our spiritual life, we have to pass through these stages of purification, illumination, and, and then union at every Mass. We do too. That's incredible. Do we ever think about that? That was the basis of Mother Teresa, what I just described. Let's look at our next picture. <clears throat> That's why Mother Teresa said, our desire is to satisfy the longings of Christ that he longs for souls, especially the poor. 
and it increases at every mass because you are going through the spiritual life if you're properly at mass listening, participating, and opening your heart to receive the grace that's in the mass. Now, if you're just sitting in the back, chomping on your gum, looking at your watch, is it over yet? Come on, Father. Yeah, you could go through mass, but you're not going to get anything out of it. But if you in the penitential right truly confess your sins and say, Lord, I am really sorry, then you really listen to the word of God in the, in the readings. You know, read the readings before you come to mass. Then the homily will make much more sense to you. Because when they're being read in the church, you're being distracted. You're, the baby's crying. The, the, the toy truck is being wheeled in the pew. People are, are sneezing and coughing. You're distracted. Read those readings before you get to Mass. And so this is what she said. She wrote, the sisters should use every means to increase love for Jesus in the blessed sacrament. All right. If we have our Lord in the midst of us, which we do at Mass and Holy Communion, I fear nothing, for the sisters nor myself are in danger. He will look after us, God, but without him, we are helpless. Man. Here we see her deeper understanding of the reality of the Eucharist and her union, her spiritual union. It was this spousal union that gave her all her energy and strength and enthusiasm. The life she lived wasn't her life, but it was that of Jesus living and working through her. You know, it's funny because Jesus told her what her vocation was. Her vocation, Jesus said, is to love and suffer to save souls. Isn't that just what Jesus did? He loved for three years in his public ministry, and then he suffered on the cross. Notice it includes suffering. So Mary's not out of this either. It's not just uh, Jesus and Mother Teresa. Mary was here too. You know what? This is also fascinating to me. You know what Mary wanted Mother Teresa to do? Mother Teresa, Mary indicated to Mother Teresa that she wanted her to continue what she did in the Annunciation. Okay, what's the Annunciation? It's when Gabriel came and announced to Mary she'd be the mother of Christ. Now, listen to this. <clears throat> At the Annunciation, Mary received Jesus in her heart and in her womb. And then, with Jesus, she went in haste to take Jesus to the world, starting with Elizabeth, John the Baptist, and others. So Mother Teresa said the Annunciation was Our Lady's first Holy Communion Day. You know, we always celebrate doing first Holy Communion. Oh, little, little um, Sandra, this is your first Holy Communion Day. Beautiful. When was Mary's first Holy Communion Day? At the Annunciation, Mother Teresa said. This is fascinating. So just as Mary received Jesus at the Annunciation and then went in haste to take Christ to others, she said, we Marian, um, in our hearts, we're Marian. We have to take, through Mary, Christ to the people. So the missionaries of charity, she told them, you are to receive Jesus in Holy Communion and then go in haste to give him to the other people, especially the poor. So let's look at our next slide. This is what Our Lady told Teresa to do, to bring the poor to Jesus and carry Jesus to them. Look what she's doing. We see the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, but also in the disguise of the poorest of the poor. You know, there are people... I have a friend in Buffalo. She was taking care of an elderly man and he was laying on the bed and all he was wearing was white diapers, almost like the cloth of Christ on the cross. And she was wearing, she saw him and he was wearing, and, and he was laying on the bed like this, outstretched. And she goes, oh my goodness. And she looked he was Christ. 
He was laying on the bed naked except for this little diaper, this white diaper. Arms stretched out, suffering terribly. And she looks at him. It was Christ. And, and, and she said, what, what a compelling moment in her life. This is what Mother Teresa is telling us. And so let's look at our next slide. There's Mother Teresa. And Jesus told her, carry me with you into the people. I cannot go alone. This is Jesus saying something I cannot do. I cannot go alone. They don't know me. They don't want me. You go and take me. So guess what, everybody? Your family, your friends, your co-workers, Jesus can't go there alone. They don't want him. They reject him. Jesus is saying, you take me there. I never thought about that. I'm sitting on the plane at two o'clock in the morning. And as I'm, I'm looking at this, it's like this light went on. That's the whole message, the whole meaning of our life. The whole message, the whole meaning of our life. How amazing. And he says, I, I, I can't go there. They reject me. They hate me. You have to take me there. You love them. They will accept you. And then you bring me to them. Now, of course, God could do it. Yes, God could have come down. He didn't need 12 apostles. God could have met with everybody in the world simultaneously and changed the world, absolutely redeemed it without even going to the cross. Yes, he's God. But he chose to do it this way to honor our free will. If people's free will rejects God, he's going to use us as tools to get to them. Jesus wants them to go not as social workers. This is the whole misconception of the Catholic Church today. That we are only social workers. That we are only social justice people. No, we are the truth. Both. And so she said, carry Jesus into the people's homes and hearts. Jesus wants us to visit the people. Because he cannot get into their hearts. They're hardened. He is helpless to do his own work without us. And we are helpless to do his work without him. This is what Jesus told Mother Teresa. This is in her writings. And as I'm sitting there reading, it again, this like epiphany. It's like, wow, this is why God needs us. Not because he can't do it on his own, but he chooses to honor our free will. In a sense, Jesus depends on us to help save souls. Now, his crucifixion, passion, death, and resurrection save souls, but we participate in it. And we depend totally on Jesus to do it. So let's look at our next slide. This is, you'll see this at every missionary charity house. When I used to go to the missionaries of charity in Washington, D.C., this is what you saw at every house. A crucifix, and next to it, I thirst. All right? In Mother Teresa, there was this insatiable spousal longing to be united with God like a spouse which became identical with Christ's longing to be united with the poor. That's why it says, I thirst. I long. Do you know when you're super thirsty, you long for, for, to be satisfied, to have that, 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 that filling to drink, the, to keep you living, to give you life. Water gives us life. That's why we're baptized in water. And this is what, what Jesus told her. And so she realized it. And, 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 and so Mother Teresa, this, this desire to be united with Christ, it was identical with Christ's desire to be united with the poor. The thirst that he had on the cross to save souls, to love souls. That is what we see in I Thirst. Amazing. All right, there was a great article I want to quote from uh, called Mother Teresa's Darkness. Now, let's get back to this dark night of the dark soul because I'm going to expand on what we talked about last week. This was by Father Raymond D'Souza. I want to pull a little bit from his, his work. I thought it was very good. I read so much. This is the benefit of you guys joining me on Saturdays because I go through tons of documents and books and help with Chris Sparks, with the, our theologian, um, 
reading articles, going to back to seminary. The biggest one is going back to seminary. I needed help on this one. I didn't have a lot in seminary in Mother Teresa, but boy, does it make sense. All right, the work to declare Mother Teresa a saint. Before she becomes a saint, what is she? A blessed. And before Saint uh, Mother Teresa was made a saint, she had to be a blessed. So they basically, in 2003, when she was made a blessed, it included this tons of review of her letters. They discovered these letters she wrote. And they revealed that she had this interior life that was filled of darkness and suffering. Tons of darkness and suffering for over 50 years. Can you imagine? And we get flustered when we don't think our prayers for a new car is going to be answered. <laughs> All right. So she had this experience of the absence of God. She couldn't feel him. But she never lost faith. That's a true test of faith. What is faith? Believing without seeing. So if Jesus puts you in the darkness, the dark night, and doesn't allow you to see, but you still believe, guess what? You have faith. You see that? Faith is believing without seeing. Now, if Jesus came down and appeared to all of us, people always say that, like, like the Bible. Why don't you come off the cross and free yourself and show all of us your God, then we will believe. That's not faith. That's just observation. Jesus could come down right now and appear to every one of us. But that's not faith. Faith is believing without seeing. And so if he wants us to believe and have faith, what does he got to do? Without seeing means he's got to take away that part. That is the dark night of the soul. All of a sudden, you don't see him. You don't feel him. But do you still believe? If you do, you have faith. Because faith is believing without seeing. So if God takes away the seeing and you still believe, you've got faith. Believing without seeing. It's amazing. And all this is is clicking for me, and I want to share it with you because I'm like, whoa, this is where people are going through it. And they think that it's a negative or God hates them. Mother Teresa went through this for 50 years. So for most of us, we believe drawing close to God is all about peace and joy and consolation. Understandable. But God, here's the point, everybody. God does grant those moments, peace, joy, and consolation, so that when times get tough, we don't give up. Mother Teresa never got that 50 years of tough times. Why? Because he knew that she would keep her faith, and then he could use those graces for other people. So by Mother Teresa remaining faithful, although he didn't give her the consolations and allowing her to see him, he could then give it to other people. Because she kept going in faith to believe this is how you can help your loved ones. This is how you can help your loved ones. To have faith. Now, God grants these, as I said, so that in tough times we don't give up. But we know from the writings of many saints that when you are advanced in your spiritual life, God with, will withhold consolations so that you seek him for his own sake, not for what he does for you. If, a, if God is just Santa Claus, you are faithful to him only because of what he gives you. Now, do you love somebody only for what they give you? Do you love your wife because she only gives you meals, sex, and works to give you the money? Now, what if those are taken away? Do you still love her? Uh, now I don't. Then it's not true love. But if those things are taken away and you love her for her, although she's not giving you f f meals and sex and money, but you still love her, now it's real. And God is taking away these consolations sometimes, not... Not food, sex, and money, because that's not me. But, but in his own way, his feeling of presence to see how we will 
react? Will we still have faith? Is what is called the dark night of the soul by John, the Cro John of the Cross. It doesn't mean that the world is bad, but that the soul itself feels the lack of light. It doesn't see. It's a form of agonizing spiritual purification. But the soul is drawing very close to God if you're going through it. If you are having a tough time to pray, if you are having a tough time of feeling presence of God, if you are having a tough time staying focused in prayer, but you still have faith, you may be going through the dark night. And this is the subject of my talk last week. Dark night of the soul, you can look it up. So the Bishop of Calcutta in 1955, get a load of this, told Teresa, God seems to hide himself at times. That may be painful, and if it lasts for a long time, it becomes a martyrdom. And guess what he pointed to? The little flower, St. Therese. He said she passed through that, as did the great St. Teresa of Avila, and many great saints. So let's take a look at this. Let's look at our next slide. St. Therese. You know, this is another thing I didn't realize till last night. You know what that bishop told her? That bishop told Mother Teresa that you are coming in the line of your patron saints. Now, with the name of Teresa, who would be Mother Teresa's patron saints? Therese of Lisieux and St. Teresa of Avila. They all had the dark night. So if your name is Teresa, <laughs> you might want to be, be asking if God has big plans for you. Because that's what basically the bishop told her. Your patron saints, your Teresa, your patron saints are St. Teresa of Lisieux and St. Teresa of Avila. They all went through the dark night. For Mother Teresa, that darkness was 50 years. So let, let's look at our next slide. This is interesting. Mother Teresa said, if I ever become a saint, and she did, I will surely be one of darkness, not evil, darkness. I will continually be absent from heaven to light the light of those in darkness on earth. What an incredible quote. Wow. And that's why, let's look at our next slide, she divined poverty. Poverty is not just material poverty, lacking food and clothes and shelter, even though that is huge. She said real poverty? She knew this. She knew the first one, the material, because she cared for those living in poverty. Yet she always spoke of a deeper poverty, poverty of the spirit. The poverty that comes from not knowing God and living far from him. She said, that's the greatest poverty. It's not what car you drive or even if you have a car. The greatest poverty is not knowing God. All right, not, not, living is in, in not living with him. Now we know that she felt close to these souls that were in poverty. Why? Because she also knew the absence of God. So if these souls in poverty do not feel the presence of God, either because material they have nothing or spiritually they have nothing, guess what, everybody? Here's God sending this little four-foot hunched-over nun and says, I'm bringing you somebody from me who understands you because I've just cut her off from everything. I've cut her off from all consolation in prayer. I've cut her off from all joy and, and giddiness in prayer. I've cut her off completely. Now she's one of you. Now she feels the absence. She feels the poverty. Because poverty is not just material. Poverty is the absence of God. And now she feels it. She relates to these people. Amazing. Amazing how this just all started clicking to me. And this is what I wanted to share with you. I'm so excited to do this talk. Because to me, it's just, this is it. All right? So let's look at our next slide. This is powerful. She knew it only as those closest to God know it. As Jesus on the cross knew it. What happened to Jesus? He too was cut off from God the Father. 
He too experienced absence. Why? He cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This is incredible. So not only is it the people in the gutter that feel the absence of God, then God sends a mother Teresa as a living one among them that feels the absence of God. But now Teresa's imitating Christ himself on the cross who feels the absence of God. It's all connected. Now, why did Jesus feel the absence of God? Did God the Father reject him on the cross? No, but God let Christ feel what it was like that these people feel on earth. So Mother Teresa felt it, Jesus felt it. This is Jesus' dark night, the dark night of the soul. Because it was felt what that, the, the, to be without God so that, that, that their faith continues without seeing. And Christ, without God, felt like, although he never didn't have faith, of course, he's from the Father, but that he could, he could relate to what these poverty people were living, not just in poverty of material, but poverty in spirit, lacking the, the feeling of connection with God. This is what the dark night is. And this is why I did Mother Teresa right after my last week's talk on the dark night of the soul. Now, just as she brought, listen to this, just as she brought the light of compassion and charity to the physically suffering, she also thought her experiences might help to bring the light of Christ to those who are in spiritual darkness. All right? The words that make her letters well known in the media were darkness and God is absent. So you know what the media did in their classic example? The media attacked and called her an atheist. Look at you, Catholic Church. You're so pathetic that even somebody you call a saint doesn't even believe in God. No, she believed in God without seeing. Faith equals belief without seeing. She didn't lack the belief which the media accused her of. She always believed. She lacked the seeing of God. So God had her have faith because she believed without seeing. We too should believe without seeing, but we have it much better. We see him. We see God in the Eucharist, right? And so this is, this is powerful. So now, this was not intended to go to the public though. Um, it was just how she strove to see God beyond the eyes, all right? So these reports from the media said that she was this atheist. No. Now, there's another great article called Dark Night of Mother Teresa. This is by Kirill Zaleski. Let's look at our next slide. No saint has ever been more in the public eye by caring for the poor than Mother Teresa. Now, there she is with Princess Diana. Even Princess Diana, look at that. Isn't that hilarious? Princess Diana wasn't some giant, but look at her next to Mother Teresa. Now, I mean, I'm a wrestler, so I'm not a basketball player. I'm not tall. I'm a wrestler. I'm short. But Mother Teresa would only come up to about here on me. <laughs> and she changed the world. We put all this emphasis on physical appearance and physical stature, and it's like, just like King David. The Lord says... I don't judge what the world judges. Look at this. There's Lady Diana, this large, bigger-than-life figure, beautiful. And there's this little 80-year-old diminutive nun hunched over who was changing the world. Even more than Princess Diana. Amazing. So her letters show that Mother Teresa was a classic Christian mystic. All right? Classic. Um, whose inner life was burning with charity, whose faithfulness was tested, but intensified and purified by trial. This is the dark night of the soul. Her dark night, and, and you again might be going through it. If you are going through suffering and feeling like God is not present, but you still believe in him, there's a great chance you're going through a dark night. Now, this does not apply to most of the world because they don't believe in God because they don't care. That has nothing to do with it. And they might be suffering. Well, you shouldn't say to your drug dealing, uh, cohabitating, atheist friend down the street who says, man, I'm really suffering. Oh, you might be going through a dark night of the soul. 
No. Because the first part of the dark night of the soul is you still believe, you still have faith. So that's not it. But you, if you still have faith, if you still believe, even though you don't feel God, you might be going through a dark night. This is why I felt it was so important to share this with you. Last week's talk on dark night of the soul and this week's talk on Mother Teresa who lived it. All right. Now, her dark night united her with the darkness and hopelessness of the poor. What they felt. She knew them well. She lived with them. She worked with them. She took care of them. And now she felt what they felt, abandonment. It's, it's so amazing how this connects because she's living amongst the people who are the utter abandoned, left to die, a woman being eaten by rats, being covered with ants. She, that woman, is the number one woman to stand up and say, I've been abandoned. When I look at something like that, I have no right to even claim I've been abandoned. But when I see a woman laying in the gutter, as Mother Teresa did, being eaten by rats and covered with ants, she's been abandoned. So Mother Teresa, in her dark night of the soul, now relates to what it's like to be abandoned. And now she needs to bring Jesus to these people because she had Jesus. They had none of the three. They didn't have faith, they didn't have belief, and they didn't have seeing God. Well, she had faith, she had belief, she didn't see God either, so she could relate to them. Now she needs to bring faith and belief to those people, and she did. Simply by being Christ to them. That's how you bring belief and faith. You just be Christ to these people. Amazing how she did this. One of the greatest souls to ever do this. So her letters show that she, she had this. Now, her dark night, we, you know, we may prefer to think that she spent her days in this ecstasy. You know, when, when I was growing up, I thought Mother Teresa, wow, I bet she really had, was amazing in prayer. She probably prayed 20 hours a day, you know, had all this mystical union with God. No, she had none of that. She had to rely on blind darkness where she still believed. How else could she did what she did if she didn't have belief? Yet we have her testimony that what made her work possibly was not this subjective experience of ecstasy, but this objective relationship with God, relationship to God without feeling his presence. Again, faith is belief without seeing. So in the history of of all of our Christian spirituality, there have been many accounts of saints going through darkness, right? God dwells in the light. Here's why. Now, why, is, why does God want to darken, not light? Isn't he light himself? I'm the truth, the way, and the life, but I'm also the light. Okay. God dwells in a light that's so bright, it cancels out everything else. Have you ever been inside? And maybe your shades were pulled and you go outside and it's a bright sunny day. When the sun breaks out of the clouds, it's so bright, it, it blots out everything else. Now all of a sudden, the sun is so bright, I can't see that tree in front of me or that bike over there. I, I, I can't see it. The light is so bright that I become, everything else becomes Blot it out. That's the darkness. God is showing you him, preparing you for union. So what he's doing is he's making everything else dark so that when he comes to you in that brightness of light and spiritual union, the third level, everything else is blown away. Everything else is blotted out. This is what the message is. All right, so anyway, how did this go? All right, so we have her testimony. All right, that um, in the history, okay, it, it, this, is, this is the whole point, everybody. Um, love, how do you see then if, if God blots out everything else? All right, all right. Well, God blots out everything else because it cancels out all the images and ideas that we had of him. Well, I thought God was Santa Claus. I thought God was just gonna give me whatever I want. I just thought God didn't care and hates me. The true light of God will blow all that other stuff away. It'll blow it all away. Any image you had of him, 
the dark night will, will make you forget anything, any preconceived false notion you had of God, because then you will only have the true light. Now, love is the eye with which we see God, and love itself is understanding, all right? So love, though, is not to be confused with feelings. You've heard me say this all the time. I want a divorce. Really, honey? Why? I no longer feel in love with you. Oh, okay. And you've heard me say the example of my knucklehead ex-brother-in-law. 24 years of marriage to my sister. Comes into her one day and announces, I, I'm getting a divorce. I no longer feel the fireworks when you walk in the room. You've heard me say this before. If you have fireworks, every single time you walk into the room with your spouse after 24 years of marriage, you can be a case study. Because it doesn't happen. Emotions go like this. You are going to have the good. You are going to have the bad. Love is not an emotion. Love is an act of the will. It's a decision. I choose to love you. Now, we're not asking people to remain in a dangerous relationship full of abuse or, or something like that. That's, that's not what we're talking about. But love is a commitment. I've always used the example. No parent feels like getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning and changing a dirty diaper. No parent jumps up and down. Oh, goody. Oh, boy. Yay. I get to change and wipe a dirty bottom. No parent says that. The parent uh, grabs the diaper, grabs the wipes, makes it into the bedroom and cleans the baby up, kisses the baby, tucks the baby back in because they make an act of the will, a decision that I'm going to love that baby. I don't feel like changing a dirty bottom, but because I love that baby, I've made the decision. That is love. And so we make a decision to love God. It, love is not to be confused with feelings. Feelings burn out too easily. They go up and down. They change too often. The love by which we see God must be an act of the will, not just passing affections. We got to love him through the good and the bad because of who he is, not just what he does. He's not just Santa Claus. Even in the darkest of night of the soul, St. John of the Cross taught us that God is present, purifying the soul of all passions and things that, that, that hinder us from union with him. Only in modern times has the dark night of the soul been misunderstood to mean doubt or, or not being in the love of God or that God hates me or God's not present or God doesn't exist. Only modern times has said that. The saints before us all knew that that wasn't the dark night of the soul. This temptation, there's only one remedy. Pay no attention to it. Pay no attention. All right, so final couple here pages. All right, now, this is exactly the way Mother Teresa learned to deal with her trial by faith, right? This is, this is very much how she dealt with it, all right? By converting her feeling, listen to this. If you learn nothing else from this talk, if you're starting to fall asleep, listen to this one line. Mother Teresa dealt with her dark night of the soul by converting her feelings of abandonment, which you may have, by God, I'm abandoned by God. She took those feelings. She took those feelings of abandonment by God and turned them into an act of abandonment to God. So instead of saying, God, you abandoned me, she turned around and said, God, how can I abandon myself to you? How can I give up everything that I'm attached to, abandon myself totally to you? That's the answer of the dark night of the soul. That's what God is preparing us to do. And if you don't respond to it, you're missing a huge grace. She believed it would be her Gethsemane, her cavalry, her participation in the crucifixion, in her thirst that Jesus suffered. It gave her access to deep poverty of the modern world, meaningless loneliness that these people felt 
both materially and spiritually. She felt it with them. But she kept smiling. She kept smiling during the dark night. It wasn't a cover-up. It was her act of the will. She made a decision. I'm going to be a joyful apostle. Have we done that? That's what I really tried to do at the airport yesterday. Had I not been doing this report on Mother Teresa, I probably would not have been a good disciple of joy. <laughs> I probably would have been like, you got to be kidding me. Now you're not letting me on the plane. Instead, instead, with the grace of God and the intercession of Mother Teresa, I smiled and I said, you know what? If you could help me, God bless you. But if you can't, I totally understand. That's not normally me. I normally don't react that way. And afterwards I realized, whoa, Mother Teresa, you're interceding for me right now. <laughs> because it was, it was amazing. Amazing. And this is why she insisted that adoration of Christ present in the Blessed Sacrament made to be the center of the uh, missionaries of charity who they were. They knew by their act of the will of God that he was present even if they didn't feel it. That is the Eucharist. How can you say, Lord, how, how could you say this? Father Chris, how do you expect me to believe in the presence of God when I don't feel it? It's not about feelings. It's about a decision, an act of the will. And I make an act of the will that I believe Christ is in that Eucharist even if I don't feel it. That's what she did with the missionaries of charity. She got them all to say that even when we don't feel God, we make the act of belief that we know he's there. That's why you say to your spouse, even though I feel like killing you right now, I'm making an act of the will to love you. <laughs> that is the whole message. All right. So this is incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. All right. This is why she established Communities that were contemplative, not just apostolic. Contemplative means you spend the time in prayer. Apostolic means you go out into the world. She did both. You know, in tantum ergo, when we, um, when we expose, you've all been to adoration, right? What, do you guys know the song, tantum ergo, sacramentum, that we play, right? Right before benediction? Do you know, you know what the words are? If you read the words in English, listen to Thomas Aquinas. To all appearances, he is absent. So faith must supply what is lacking to our feeble senses. That's the words of the Tantamirgo that you sing every time you go to adoration. You have no idea what you're saying. Tantamirgo sacramentum. We don't know what we're saying. That's what you're saying. To all appearances, he is absent. So faith must supply what is lacking to our feeble senses. Humanly, there were times when Mother Teresa felt burned out, yes, but faith supplied what she was lacking. St. Therese of Lisieux, kind of her mentor, she said, do not believe I am swimming in consolations. Oh no, my consolation is to have none on earth. <laughs> My consolation is to have no consolations. She described herself as enclosed in a dark tunnel. This is the little flower. It is probable that Mother Teresa, who died on the same month, exactly 100 years after little Therese, made the same vow. Same name. Same vow. She suffered the same desolation of faith or presence of God and embodied the same teaching of faithfulness in the midst of the dark night. Amazing. Could it be that this ministry, listen to this, I, I, I think this is awesome. This article summed it up. Could it be that this missionary contemplative, that was Therese, she was a contemplative who was a missionary, and this contemplative missionary, so this missionary contemplative, Therese, and this contemplative missionary, Mother Teresa, we're joined by God to bookend the 20th century. Did you ever get that? Therese died right in the beginning of the 20th century. Mother Teresa died at the very end of the 20th century. They were the bookends of this incredible message. Amazing. This is what they were. 
And current days, you know, if current days are any sense of the dark night for the church, the church is going through the dark night. Did you know that? We have to be purified. We got to be purified of the scandal. We got to purify it of our lack of belief. We are going through the dark night, the church is right now. We're in the purification stage. Then we will go through the illumination stage. We'll have an illumination of conscience. We've been talking about that. That is where God will allow you to see your soul as God sees it. You've heard about the warning. The warning is the illumination of conscience. The church right now is going through the purification stage. We're being ripped. Scandals being exposed. We're being purified. Get rid of these bad priests. Then we will go through the illumination of conscience. The, the illumination, the warning. Then Mother Teresa, she'll show us the way for union with God. We have the faith that we are undergoing a purification rather than some free fall. We have fidelity, faithfulness in the small and the big things, faithfulness to our vows. That's who the church needs to build around. Now, there is a priest that does the homilies at the, at the Vatican called Father Canta La Mesa. And he explained that the fact that Mother Teresa suffered deeply from her feeling of the absence of God affirms that it was a positive thing. You know why? Because atheists, he said, are not afflicted by God's presence or uh, absence. They don't care. For her, this was the most terrible thing. For an atheist, they wouldn't care. I don't care if God's absent because I don't believe he exists. This is why Therese or Mother Teresa was not an atheist as the media tried to say. Her secret life was a living hell. She told this to her spiritual director in 1957. Let's read her own words. As I, I, I know I'm running late here, I wanna wrap this up, but let's read her own words. Let's go to the next slide. Listen to her own words. This is amazing. In the darkness, Lord, my God, who am I that you should forsake me? Right? This, it's amazing. The child of your love has now become the most hated one. Have you ever felt this way? I bet you have. The one you have thrown away as unwanted, unloved. I call, I cling, I want, and there is no one to answer. We've all felt this way. Where I try to raise my thoughts to heaven, there is such convicting emptiness that those very thoughts return like sharp knives and hurt my very soul. Woe. Love, the word, it brings nothing. I am told God lives in me, and yet the reality of darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. Again, the media twisted that to mean she doesn't believe in God. She has faith. She has belief. She just didn't feel the presence. She didn't see it. Mother Teresa lived in this spiritual desert, panicked that she couldn't feel God, but never giving up her faith. Let's read her next slide. These are her next words. She said, they say people in hell suffer eternal pain because of the loss of God. In my soul, I feel just this terrible pain of loss, of God not wanting me, of God not being God, of God not really existing. She said she feels it. She didn't say she believes it. That terrible longing keeps growing, and I feel as if something will break in me one day. Again, I bet you felt this. Heaven from every side is closed. I feel like refusing God. Now she's talking what she feels like. God, pray for me that I may not turn a Judas to Jesus in this painful darkness. Wow. Never before in the history of saints have we been given such an honest account of the dark night of the soul. Is what we just read. In Mother Teresa's dark night, we can hear all the anguish of what's going on in the world. The desolation of the poor cries of unwanted children, cries of aborted children, cries of the atheists, all those who can't pray for themselves or love another, she is. It was as if, if in some way she was bearing the sufferings, not only of the people, but of Christ. We're going to show a quick video. This is really quick. It's only one minute. This video on EWTN summarizes Mother Teresa's Dark Night of the Soul. And when we come back, we're almost finished. So hang with us. Let's talk to this quick video. 
It wasn't easy being Mother Teresa, okay? Just being a foundress and a leader of this 4,000 member worldwide organization would be challenging enough. But then just being Mother Teresa, go here, go there, the war there, speak there, people coming to see you, to ask you, you were, that was, you were always on, even on the airplane. And so <clears throat> you, we were probably assuming that, well, at least she's experiencing this wonderful union and constellation to keep her going. And then we discover that it's just heroic uh, you know, faith, and she lives from 4.40 in the morning until late at night, and no siesta until the very last years. Part of the trial was that she felt this, the, the spiritual poverty of our age, she was experiencing herself. Okay, she will, if it's the greatest poverty in the world to be unloved, unwanted, uncared for, she's experiencing that with Jesus. Okay, so there's a great summary, just a short little thing from EWTN that tells us who Mother Teresa was and what she was going through. You know, the bottom line is this, everybody. After she died, we learned about that in her early missionary days, 50 years earlier, she had made a private vow to be the spouse of Christ, united with him to be all for Jesus, to refuse him nothing. And you know what her suffering was this dark night? Her vow of self-offering was being put to the test. God was saying, okay, God bless you. But now I'm going to ask you, not just because God's some kind of um, masochist that just wants to see us suffer, but he wants to know if she's willing to experience the dryness to bring others the consolation instead of her getting it. They get it. All right, would she really refuse him nothing? Would she drink this cup that the Lord drank? Would she lay down her life as he laid down his? Offer herself as Christ did, completely without reserve? This is the dark night. This is what God may be asking you to do. Well, Father, I don't have the physical strength to do it. Okay, he may be asking you to surrender your will. Instead of watching this TV program, you watch what your spouse wants to watch. In the dark night, Jesus was claiming her for his own, for her to be his spiritual bride, pruning her self-love and pride, purifying her heart, mind, stripping away everything that would block her union with God. Let's read one more quote from her because I think it's powerful. Let's put this up on the screen. Mother Teresa said, if my pain and suffering, my darkness and separation give you a drop of consolation. She's talking to Jesus, my own Jesus. Do with me as you wish, like Mary. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. I am your own. Imprint on my soul and life the suffering of your heart. If my separation from you brings others to you, that's what I've been talking about, I am willing with all my heart to suffer all that I suffer. Woe, your happiness is all that I want. I have begun to love my darkness. For I believe now that it is a part, a very small part of Jesus' darkness and pain on the earth. She's sharing the cross of Christ. I want to satisfy your thirst with every single drop that you can find in me. Woe. So the next slide. Jesus came took Mother Teresa home September the 5th, 1997, the end of the century. That's why her feast day is September the 5th. That's the day she died. So she had been this apostle in the light of darkness, this joy. Now, here's a picture of her funeral. Let's go to the next slide. She died 100 years, almost to the day, that we talked about mother, uh, uh, her patron, St. Therese, the little flower. Their lives basically, as I said, bracketed the 20th century. Therese too experienced nights of darkness. Do you know that Mother Teresa, I'm sorry, um, St. Therese of Lisieux, did you know this? Do you know on her deathbed, this is St. Therese, the little flower. Do you know on her deathbed, 
She heard demonic voices? She did. They told her that heaven was just a figment of her imagination. We're all going to face that test. Strengthen your faith. Mother Teresa's secret during her lifetime? These things have all now been disclosed. She thought they were secret. But now they show us to understand the meaning of her life, that, that this was God using her for love, working through her. She was our mother. She came to us in the darkness of the 20th century. More martyrs in that century than any other. Gave us comfort, proved to us that we had not been orphaned by God. To the physical poor, they were not orphaned. To the spiritually poor, they were not orphaned. She felt the pain so they wouldn't have to. For the despised and the unwanted, for those who had defiled themselves in sin and bad living, she wanted to prove the love of God to them. To make the mercy of God very real and to induce the dying person to turn to God with trust. Just like Faustina, this is the same message. Same message of Faustina. Helping others to die, she was teaching them how to live. This is what I think my mom is going through right now. Like confidence of a child finding their father. And me finding my own father and seeing his love for taking care of my mom. She was an apostle sent to us in our time of dying in this culture of death to show us that there is life. Hers was a ministry that believed in the final moments there was a last chance. She believed in deathbed conversions. Did you know that? She believed that it was never too late for any of us. Now, I wouldn't suggest waiting to the last minute. Do it. Don't be presumptuous. She said, I am convinced that even one moment is enough to ransom an entire miserable lifetime. Wow. And then lastly, this David Scott did a real good thing, an article called Finding Joy in the Darkest Night. He talked about Mother Teresa. I want to finish with his comments. This is great. He said, Mother Teresa might have been one of the most joyful people who ever lived. Do you know she, la she would laugh so hard she would buckle over. This little four-footer. She laughed so hard. No other saint spoke or write as much about smiling and laughing as Mother Teresa did. I bet you didn't know that. She always smiled. In one vision, in the start of her ministry, she was transported as a child to Golgotha. There she stood at the foot of the cross with Mary, and she was a little kid, and she spoke to Jesus on the cross. Can you imagine? This is what St. Faustina had, this kind of grace. From that point on, Christ never spoke to her again. She had to rely on faith so that Christ could give those consolations to other people. From then, her prayer life was silent, but her public life remained steadfast, an act of the will, not my feelings. Oh, woe is me. Lord, you didn't give me all these consolations in prayer. Oh, woe is me. What did I do? Oh, 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 me, me, me. No, no. She realized that if I can help other people, I'll take on this suffering. Let's look at our next slide. She appears to have been giving us a lesson in the meaning of Christian joy. I love this quote. Some people come into our life as blessings. Some come into your life as lessons. <laughs> Somebody correcting you? Maybe God sent them. All right, we never had any inkling of how much she suffered when she was alive. She always had joy. That's a true saint. Some of us just, I was the worst. When I went to the airport and everything was falling apart, everybody knew it. Finally, last night, I found a different way. What joy. And God got me home. God got me home. Her smile, genuine, joyful heart, one had given herself completely to God. It was a message we needed to hear in a culture that defines happiness as basically nothing but self-centered pursuit of sex, money, and power. Material comforts. 
That's what the world tells us brings happiness. Uh Uh-uh. I might be happy with some material things, but I'm not joyful. Joyful only comes from God. Like the first disciples, she rejoiced in her trials. She was thankful to be counted worthy to suffer with Jesus. You know, remember, she told us that the passion of Christ always ends with the joy of the resurrection. There is no Easter Sunday without Good Friday. Now, our last few slides, this one. There are now more than 4,000 missionaries of charity. Look at them there. What beautiful souls. They are the largest missionary order of women in the church. So look at our next slide. She was beatified in 2003, and Francis declared her a saint. September the 4th, 2016, guess what? In the year of mercy. In the year of mercy. In Calcutta, Catholic sisters pray, but so do Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists. They all come to her tomb. That's true evangelization. Look at our next slide. This is one of my favorite quotes. What can you do to promote world peace? Go home and love your family. Wow. She is truly a saint for the new millennium like St. Faustina. That's why I think she was one of the last saints to die in the 20th century, and St. Faustina was the first saint of the 21st century. You ever think about that? Amazing. So, I'm done. God bless you, but I I wanted to say one of the things that I did, I I should say, I'm done talking about Mother Teresa. One of the things I did when I was in Florida is I got to see Mark Wahlberg's brother. I've become really good friends with. Jim Wahlberg. Talk about a dark night. You know, he was in prison twice addicted to drugs. We did a sit-down interview with him. It'll be on our EWTN show, Living Divine Mercy, which is every Wednesdays at 6.30 Eastern time. I was enthralled with this guy. I mean, Mark Wahlberg and Donnie Wahlberg of the New Kids on the Block and all that, they get all the publicity, but this Jim Wahlberg, silently in the background, silently going through the dark night, addiction, lack of God, Now you should see what this guy's doing. Well, anyway, he produced the movie, Mother Teresa. He produced the movie. So I want to show, it's less than two minutes, a quick video trailer of the movie, and then we're going to end up with a gift for you. We want to send you a free gift. So let's watch this movie, and we'll end with the free gift we want to give you. Let's see the trailer. I want to be a missionary to go out and give the life of Christ to the people in the missionary countries. She was a small, tiny, bent woman, but she had a commanding presence. You could feel an aura about her. An aura not of power, an aura of simplicity and holiness. She made a remarkable vow to God, never to refuse him anything or to give him whatever he would ask. She was strong, she was firm, she was a tough cookie, she was tough in Jesus. She wanted to love until it hurts. She hated publicity, she suffered the celebrity, but she accepted it if it was going to help the poor. When she smiled with the lines in her face, it was almost like an exclamation mark of joy. For Mother Teresa, there were no expendable people. Everyone has dignity and worth because everyone is made in the image of God. Lord, make me a channel of your peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light. Okay, so that's the movie about Mother Teresa 
produced by Jim Wahlberg. As I was just telling the people here at the Shrine on the break, you know, like I said, Mark Wahlberg, they're great guys. Donnie Wahlberg, great guy, singer of New Kids on the Block. Mark Wahlberg, this famous movie star. But the guy behind the scenes of that family is this Jim Wahlberg, guy who spent time in prison, dark night, addiction. And now he just wants to bring Christ to the world. It's almost like the light has come on for him now. He's, he's gone through his dark night. He's now, he didn't feel the presence of God. Now he does, and he's sharing it with others. How, it's not, I just said earlier, it's, it's not a coincidence that he did and produced Mother Teresa. <laughs> It's just amazing. So we invite you to watch that. Um, the information was there at the end of the trailer, but I want to finish with a free gift to you. If we can show our last slide there, Mother Teresa, this is the book, Praying with Mother Teresa. We want to give it to you for free, for free. All you have to do is visit our site, shopmercy.org slash Saturday. It's a special offer for this talk. So again, shopmercy.org slash Saturday. And this is a great book um, that we have uh, from uh, Susan Conroy, who's an a expert in Mother Teresa, lived with her, worked with her. You can't get a better book that describes her. Everything I said here will make so much more sense if you get that book. We want to send it to you for free. So again, shopmercy.org slash Saturday and get a copy. And you know what? Share in these graces. Become a Marian helper. Uh, if Brother Mark can put up there, micprayers.org. Doesn't cost any money. Doesn't take but a few seconds. And you can join us to share in all the graces of our masses, rosaries, penance, prayers, just like you were Marian priest or brother. God bless you. Go out there into that world and be another Mother Teresa because she was Christ to the people. So if you're like Mother Teresa, you're bringing Christ to the people. And may Almighty God help you in that endeavor. And until next week, may God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Woo, you made it. <laughs> God bless you all. Thank Hi, I'm Father Chris Ayler of the Marian Fathers, and I want to tell you about a grace I hope you don't let pass by. As a member of the Association of Marian Helpers, you can receive all the graces of our masses and prayers and penances, just like you were a Miriam priest or brother by decree of the Holy See. It doesn't cost anything and it takes but a few seconds to sign up. Please visit micprayers.org or call us at 800-462-7426. God bless you.